do vídeo, vocês têm lá interpretation ou interpretação, vocês vão selecionar ou inglês ou português, se vocês quiserem ouvir tudo em inglês ou tudo em português. Quem quiser ouvir só o som original, deixa em off, tá bom? Então, é, no canal inglês vai ser tudo falado em inglês, no canal português tudo falado em português, e no off cada um vai ouvir na língua original que está sendo transmitida. Nós também estamos indo live no YouTube, é, no YouTube fica gravado, fica gravado sempre na língua original, tá? Para poder ouvir a interpretação, vocês têm que estar tá aqui no, no canal do Zoom. Então, bem-vindos e bem-vindas a todos. Estamos bem felizes de estar aqui hoje para poder falar sobre esse assunto. A gente vai começar em um minutinho, tá bom? Então, selecionem aí os canais onde vocês querem ouvir a língua. Para quem está entrando agora, embaixo, interpretação ou interpretation. Em off, você ouve o som original. Em inglês, você ouve tudo em inglês. Em português, você ouve tudo em português. Todas as perguntas vocês podem direcionar aqui pelo chat, porque como nós estamos num webinar, não é possível quem tá a, os, a, os atendentes falarem, mas a gente vai ler tudo aqui e vai fazer uma sessão de, de perguntas, tá bom? Então, bem-vindos e bem-vindas todos. É, vamos começar, então, e aí a gente daqui a pouquinho repete essas instruções para quem for se conectando, tá? Então, uma alegria poder estar aqui, de detox dessa semana em horário especial para atender África do Sul, que está às 5 horas na frente do Brasil. Queria contar para vocês que esse é um projeto muito especial para mim. É, há exatamente um ano atrás eu estava na África do Sul, fui recebida lá pelo TED e toda a equipe do Instituto Maharishi. Eu conheci o Ted é, na Singularity University, ele estava fazendo lá um talk muito importante do projeto é, que ele tem na África do Sul, e eu achei tão interessante aquilo, procurei o Ted logo depois da palestra dele, falei, eu quero ir conhecer esse projeto, e nós fomos para a África do Sul. Eu, o Albino, meu marido, o, o Jorge, a Cris... É, e o Edu, nós fomos conhecer um pouco de perto, passei 15 dias na África do Sul em julho do ano passado, me apaixonei pelo projeto é, e vou contar um pouquinho mais para vocês, então, como é que isso vai acontecer. O TED hoje vai contar para a gente o que, que é esse projeto na África do Sul, que já está lá faz muitos anos com resultados incríveis, vocês vão entender por que, que eu me apaixonei pelo projeto. É, e aí nós viemos é, para o Brasil com essa ideia de realmente poder trazer essa experiência para o Brasil. É, conhecendo a Rose, minha querida amiga, a Rose Schettini e o Márcio, que tem a FEDUC, que é uma universidade para formação de pedagogos, também gratuita em São Paulo. Procurei eles, procurei a Flávia, que está aqui com a gente. Vocês vão entender por que da Flávia daqui a pouquinho. A, a Flávia é minha professora de meditação, uma parte importante dessa experiência ser de tanto sucesso. E nós, então, formamos esse grupo e estamos é, aí trabalhando em como trazer isso para o Brasil já fazem vários meses. E esse é o kickoff. Nós queríamos chamar vocês todos aqui para vocês entenderem como é que a gente vai, então, começar a desenvolver esse projeto. A partir de, da semana que vem, segunda-feira, nós já temos gerente de projeto para isso, e vamos começar a desenvolver isso de uma maneira mais acelerada. É, então, estou bem feliz de todo mundo poder estar tá aqui para poder ouvir essa experiência, e depois, quem quiser saber mais, participar, é, saber como é que se engaja nisso, vocês acompanhem lá o meu site, denisedamiani.com, nós vamos postar sempre as novidades e como é que isso vai indo, e nós vamos colocar aqui também um e-mail de contato do próprio projeto, que vocês podem também entrar em contato com a gente. Então, bem-vindos. Eu queria começar, para quem acabou de se conectar, só para saber, interpretation aí embaixo, vocês escolhem se querem ouvir tudo em inglês, clica em inglês, tudo em português, ou off, vocês vão ouvir o som original. É, 
Bem-vinda, Rose, Flávia e Ted. Vocês são hoje os nossos convidados especiais. Eu queria começar pedindo para que a Rose e a Flávia se apresentem e aí nós vamos passar em seguida para o Ted. Rose, quer começar? Lógico, um prazer, Dedê. Bom, obrigada pelo convite de estar aqui hoje, Ted. Um prazer enorme agora a gente está formalizando essa nossa parceria. Como a, a, a Denise falou, ela foi na África do Sul e conheceu o Instituto Maharish. E ela já conhecia a FEDUC. Então, ela só não falou quando ela me trouxe a proposta da gente estabelecer um diálogo. E eu fiquei extremamente animada em saber que a gente pode, sim, também aqui no Brasil, diminuir as desigualdades que a gente enfrenta como você fez na África do Sul. Então, a FEDU, que é uma instituição que tem esse, esse mesmo propósito, que é de diminuição de desigualdades, nossos alunos são todos bolsistas, porque a gente acredita que a gente precisa acertar essa desigualdade educacional no país. Então, essa é a FEDU, que a gente vai estar aqui dialogando, aprendendo bastante com você, Ted, e eu preciso também falar que a Flávia é minha professora de meditação. Flávia... Oh. Olá, bom dia a todos. Também queria agradecer muito a Denise por esse convite, por essa parceria com a Rose também. Também estive lá na África do Sul conhecendo o trabalho do TED, apesar da gente já fazer parte do mesmo grupo de trabalho. É, e aí eu estou muito feliz de estar trazendo, ajudar, de alguma forma, a contribuir para que esse trabalho aconteça aqui no Brasil também. E, e aí daqui a pouco a gente explica mais como a meditação pode e ajuda a influenciar é, nessa inclusão social. Very well. So, Teddy, the screen is all yours. Ah, thank you. And Denise, can I show this, share the screen? Yes. Would you like to to introduce yourself first, or you go to the screen? It's it's all yours. You you decide. Wonderful. Uh, okay. You can see the screen. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, a very warm hello from South Africa to everybody uh, here in uh, Brazil, and it's a great honor to be talking to you. And I'm very excited. Uh, I've got two little children running around outside, so if you hear any excited voices. Uh, that is the children. And uh, so, uh, yes, it's in the afternoon here about uh, four, uh, what's the time? Just after four o'clock. And um, it's a great pleasure to share with you what we've been doing here. I, I am an actuary by background. I'm, uh, I qualified as an actuary through the Institute of Actuaries in London. Um, I studied in South Africa. I have four degrees and then was awarded two honorary uh, PhD doctorates. And um, I've been involved for about 25 years in the field of uh, nonprofit work, uh, specifically working on this issue like Rose was speaking about of income inequality and, and really trying to uh, create opportunities for more young people. I'll speak more about that. Uh, but this has been the greatest joy of my life. The last 25 years, uh, it's a lot more interesting than working as an actuary. I did work as a management consultant for a top global consulting firm called Monitor Company. That's now part of Deloitte. Uh, I think it might also be in uh, Brazil as well. Um, that was based out of Boston, uh, Massachusetts and uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts actually. And uh, yes, in 1995, I was about to leave South Africa. South Africa had just changed. Um, tomorrow is actually Nelson Mandela's birthday uh, on the 18th of July. And he was our first Democrat, democratic president of the country. Uh, he came into power in the year 1994. And actually just um, you know, around that time, many, many people were leaving South Africa because of crime, because of violence, you know, many problems similar to Brazil. And I also was going to leave. I was going to go to the United States. I packed up absolutely everything. Um, I was 27 years old and I packed up uh, over 40 boxes, about 43 boxes of clothes and shoes, actuarial textbooks, everything. And I was uh, bought my air ticket. I was two weeks away from getting on the plane. And I decided I'm going to stay in the country that I was born in, that I love, instead of running away. 
and I'm going to try and make a difference uh, to South Africa. And um, so that's 25 years journey. I am now 53 and I've uh, spent this time working with many, many, many thousands of young people who have changed my life. And I'll, I'll share a little bit about that uh, with you. Uh, Denise, is the sound coming through okay? Is the translation okay? Yes. Yes, very good, very good. Perfect, okay. So this is a, our dream is to educate 100,000 unemployed youth and get them into employment to change their destiny. This is a picture of some of our graduates just celebrating at graduation. And in over 20 years now, since we started the first free university in South Africa, um, we have actually had a 95% average job placement rate, which is very high because these are unemployed youth. They can't access normal employment. And uh, you can see the happiness on their faces here. Uh, this is a, a wonderful day for them that they've spent uh, five years for usually uh, to get to this point of graduation. And, uh, and generally they have been very successful, which I will share with you and um, our methodology as well. Great, so let's, uh, okay. So firstly, uh, before going into the presentation in depth, I just wanted to really thank from my heart, firstly, this amazing uh, woman, Denise uh, Damiani, and I know some of you are uh, from Uleres de Brazil, and she's done so much in her career with Accenture, uh, with uh, sitting on so many boards, and, uh, and what she did with Muleras de, de Brazil, with other great individuals, uh, some of who are on this call. And uh, really her persistence is incredible. You know, she nearly attacked me after I gave this talk at Singularity University. And uh, now here we are more than one year later and she has not given up on this dream. Even coming to South Africa, bringing other people to South Africa, seeing what we're doing, she is a passionate individual and unstoppable. And I always say to, our students is that no army can stop uh, a person who is fully awake, it's unstoppable. So that's to Denise, I think a big uh, applause to you uh, for your, just your passion for making a difference to others. Uh, Rose, it is wonderful to meet you and uh, have learned a little bit about FEDUC, but it sounds a, like an incredible institution and we'll be very excited to partner together. And then uh, dear Flavia that has been introduced that uh, I also met in Brazil, she's visited South Africa, really a great uh, individual who's dedicated her life to uh, changing people's lives from the deepest level of consciousness, which we will talk more about. And then also it was wonderful to meet George Byra uh, from Ipe, uh, who came with his family uh, and the Byra family to South Africa. I don't know if they're on this call at all, but it was Really a great pleasure to meet them and to host them in South Africa. To all others who've been involved, thank you very, very much. This is a wonderful journey that you're embarking on and we give you our 100% support from everything we've developed, everything we have. Uh, this is just a quick picture of Brazil's unemployment uh, for youth. And as you can see, this is starting to get worrying. Now, in South Africa, I can tell you our unemployment rates are now, for youth, uh, it's, it's now at 54%. And for, for youth between the ages of 18 to 24, when they finish high school, um, we have now a 67% uh, youth unemployment rate at that age band. So just imagine that two out of three young people who come out of our school system are unemployed. And we call them NEETS. I know in Mexico, they call them NINI. Um, uh, so uh, in, in South Africa, this is actually our biggest problem is this rising youth unemployment and it's creating massive, massive income inequality. So Brazil, you should start to be getting scared of seeing this kind of chart. And this is something you have to change as a country. And we saw in South Africa, our chart also used to be quite low. And now it is just in a tailspin, uh, you know, really going in one direction and government and private sector, everyone's trying, to, you know, to change this, but it is a nightmare in our country. What is the problem? And I think the problem is really, we are coming into the 21st century, we know, and uh, we know we have this fourth industrial revolution and we have this gap. And here is a young person uh, coming out of the school system or they drop out of the school system or they finish uh, grade 12 and the economy wants them to be at the top of this mountain. 
but the young person has come out of a school system that hasn't really taught them how to think and feel and create and work with other people and really belong in a modern economy. And, and we have this talent crisis. All over the world, we have this talent crisis in the most developed countries in the world, but in countries like South Africa, like Brazil, like India, in many, many other countries in the world, this is a major problem. So children who are coming out of the very good private schools, they are very well suited to uh, you know, climb this mountain quite quickly. And, uh, but, but for children in the favelas, in the very poorest communities, they just don't know how to come into this economy in a meaningful way. And I'm not talking about manual labor because anyone can do manual labor, but we know with automation, manual labor is going to disappear over time, increasingly so. And people really have to move up the intellectual value chain. We know all over the world, jobs are being automated. This is some examples in the United States. Uh, I won't spend time on that. In Brazil, it's a big issue. Um, and if we look into the near future, you know, really um, the founder, co-founder of Singularity, Ray Kurzweil, he's estimating that artificial intelligence will have uh, reached human levels in full by 2029. And by 2045, AI will be 1 billion times smarter uh, that, than a human being. This is with our human beings may, 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 may be um, being augmented in, in different ways and, 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 and so on with technology. But how already now so many human beings are being left behind in the world. We have increasing and growing inequality, income inequality in the world. Um, and we know that this is getting worse and worse and worse. So how are we gonna create education that's gonna deal with this kind of approach? And this is something that we've been passionate about working on this problem in South Africa, now myself and my colleagues at the Marishi Invincibility Institute now uh, for some years. And if, if you look at, uh, you know, the many, many frameworks in education, I'm not gonna spend time on that. Uh, this is a World Economic Forum uh, framework you might've seen a few years ago. Um, they're talking about what are the skills you need right now this year in 2020, if you want to have a great job and hold down a successful job, you need not to have memorized content. That means almost nothing. What you need is to be able to solve complex problems, critical thinking, creativity, people management, how to coordinate with others, emotional intelligence, judgment and decision making, uh, having an orientation for service for others, negotiation skills, and cognitive flexibility. Now, these are all human qualities that are not necessarily normally taught in the educational approach, and especially in the poorest schools um, where the kind of youth that we work with come from, they don't really learn these things. They learn how to memorize things by rote, uh, they learn off by heart, uh, but they don't really understand the depth of you know, mathematics and integrating lots of different complexity together and, and pulling lots of data and making you know, decisions in a rational way, um, et, et cetera, et cetera. How to work in a multidisciplinary way, um, et cetera. So this is what is needed and yet it is not really um, being taught properly in modern education. So education is really far behind um, the technology of the day, and this causes social friction and it causes inequality. So in the Marish Institute, this is a framework of ours where we uh, talk about what is really needed in education, that education needs to move from a content-based approach. Content is important. Uh, content is you know, what you learn about in the field of physics or mathematics or business or technology, um, but that is not enough. And we need skills, skills are very important. Skills, how do you work with other people? How do you use technology? How do you develop a website? Maybe how do you develop an app? Uh, how do you program in different languages? How, you know, all these different skills. But even that is not enough. And all the latest educational frameworks, they talk about meta-learning, metacognition. Uh, so things like higher order competencies, higher order thinking. So these are those things like that the World Economic Forum was talking about there, like creativity, problem solving, um, uh, you, you know, really uh, working, being able to work with other people, emotional intelligence, et cetera. We believe even that is not enough, that the, the, the final, final frontier in education is really about mastery. How does a human being become a master? And when we use the word mastery, think of like, if you've ever watched a Bruce Lee movie, think about um, movies about ninjas, you know, people who can just do anything in any situations um, and, and just master these things. You know, I, I think of a South African, like um, he's definitely not perfect, uh, but if you take, for example, Elon Musk, 
Um, Elon Musk, you know, had a difficult upbringing. Uh, he went to not a very fancy school. Um, he went off to the U USA. He was one of the co-founders of, of PayPal. Um, but then if you know the story of how he started SpaceX and then now he's building Tesla, he's now worth $70 billion. He's in a foreign country, um, you know, completely self-made, one of the 10 richest men in the world. Uh, just an unstoppable force. A, a very dear close friend of mine has, has become over the years Sir Richard Branson out of the UK. He's having a very difficult time now with COVID, of course, because many of his industries are airlines, hotels, you know, things like that, which is very difficult in this COVID time. But what an incredible entrepreneur. And so when you think about mastery, you think about people who can just function in any situation and have extraordinary skill. And at the same time, these are individuals um, who, who, who can have happiness, inner peace, um, higher states of thinking, creativity, um, and, and, and a vision for humanity that can really achieve the kind of world that we would all like to see. So this is how we see education must work. And it, it needs to move quite strongly away from being purely content-based. So I'll just talk now about our approach in uh, Marish Invincibility Institute in South Africa. Um, this was the building where we hosted, um, of, of course, uh, Denise and uh, her wonderful husband, Albino, and uh, that was a great time uh, we had uh, for about 10 days in South Africa. And then also the Byra family, this is where Flavia came to visit. This is where I'm based every day. It's currently closed the building because of uh, COVID. Um, but this building was donated to us by one of the biggest mining companies in the country, Anglo-American. It's part of their precinct. Uh, they own a number of buildings around here in the city center of Johannesburg. It's a nine story high building and uh, we can fit over a thousand students in this building. And this is our head office. Um, Denise says some very nice news is in fact our, our founding donor. Um, because this building now is nearly full and we're wanting to expand a lot. So we've just bought a building. Actually, the transfer is going in the next two weeks. Um, just two minutes away from here, you can walk, uh, is a second building, also a nine-story building that um, is in Marshall Street, uh, just down the road from us here, and um, where we can also fit close to a thousand students in that building as well. Then we have the Marishi Invincibility Institute also in Durban. Um, so you didn't see this, but when you do come back to South Africa, then you'll visit the campus in Durban as well. And um, very, very beautiful uh, programs there. These are some of the students in Durban. And I'll say that 100% of our students are from poor families and poor communities. Nine out of 10 of these students do not have two parents. And so usually these young people are growing up with, if they're lucky, a mother or a father, but in most cases, about 80% of the case, they're growing up with a grandmother or grandfather. So they often, uh, you know, maybe don't have uh, parents, maybe grandparents, or they might come from an orphanage or something like that. Um, this is also, um, we, we have many schools where we teach meditation, which I'm going to talk more about, but that's one of the schools. And here's a program uh, on the top left here, working with young people with disabilities. So we've also done a lot of programs with young people who are disabled, just different kinds of disabilities. And this is a picture on the right of just some students coming into our Durban campus where we teach digital literacy. So we don't just teach the students who are going through university, we also open our doors to the community and we teach programs in IT, entrepreneurship, all kinds of things. And we have thousands of courses to make available. Obviously, um, uh, these are in English, not in Portuguese, but um, everything we have is yours. And, uh, and, and I'm sure, you know, Rose has beautiful materials, of course, in, uh, for Duke, for training teachers, but in every other field where we can be of assistance, uh, we, we are there to support. Um, good news as well is uh, we are starting now actually in Cape Town, which is a very beautiful city for those of you who visited Cape Town. And I just wanted to show this picture because I, I know that you have some major banks in Brazil that are interested in this project. So we partner with the third biggest bank in South Africa, they're called Absa Bank. And we've placed many, many, many graduates into this bank. And the reason we have such a strong partnership with them is because they love our graduates. And they've now employed hundreds of our graduates, over 50 of our graduates are very, very senior in this bank, heads of different divisions, et cetera. 
And this is one of their buildings and it's in Cape Town and they've given us a section of this building uh, completely for free that, that we can run our university in Cape Town in. So it just gives you a sense of how a nonprofit can partner with a for-profit bank um, uh, or other kinds of, of, of businesses. We also were very fortunate to uh, be donated a nature reserve. These are all real pictures taken from our nature reserve in, uh, in South Africa. And these are just, um, it's a very, very beautiful place. It's called Ezenvelo Nature Reserve. And we run programs all around con um, uh, conservation, sustainability, green energy, environmental issues, et cetera, for our students in this nature reserve, which is one of the biggest issues the world is facing around climate change. Now, this is just a picture of our partner university in America, the Marish International University in Iowa. Um, it's an incredible university. It's been going for 50 years now. And uh, this is the dining hall. Uh, the building is called Argero. Uh, this is just a quick picture. Um, it was a very narrow picture, so I just copied it twice. Um, but this is a picture of their campus in, in Iowa, and it's... Um, uh, you know, hundreds of hectares and a, a very, very beautiful place. I've been there many times. Flavia also has been there. And this is the Marish International University. And anyone on the line uh, who wants to learn about them, it's miu.edu. And they are world experts in this approach of consciousness-based education that I'm going to talk a lot about. So graduates from MIU, as our graduates, have been very, very well accepted in, into the market. And so this is actually, uh, this picture here, you see the guy in the middle there is one of our students from South Africa who went to America then to do his master's. And many of our graduates from South Africa have gone on to do master's degrees in America. Some are even doing PhDs and then, and then they come back to South Africa. A few have stayed in America. Uh, but, but most have come back to South Africa. And also just to say, these graduates have been accepted into Cornell and Harvard and Berkeley and uh, John Hopkins and you name it across the board. And, um, uh, you know, the MIU graduates, they also have like, for example, in their computer science program, they have a 98% uh, job placement rate. So they've placed um, over 5,000 masters, uh, computer science engineers into uh, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, you name it, in uh, across the United States. And, and they've been very, very, very successful as well with job placements. And um, so, for example, as I say, in some of their programs, 98% job placement rate, that's really, really exceptional. Um, so, Denise, is sound coming out okay? Up until now, is everything clear? Everything is really fine. Wonderful. Okay, so guys, now I'm going to talk a little can, bit can about... I, can I stop Please. you one moment just to give an example? The thing that... He, um, eu vou falar em português, desculpa. É, a, a coisa que mais me bateu quando eu ouvi o Ted falar na Singularity é porque, como vocês sabem, eu fui muitos anos sócia da Accenture. E ele me contou que naquele ano, o ano passado, o ano retrasado, das 34 vagas que a Accenture na África do Sul tinha abertas, as 34 foram preenchidas por alunos que saíram do, do Instituto Maharishi. E aquilo realmente me chocou, porque eu conheço as universidades onde a Accenture faz é, recrutamento. Então, como é que pode é, as pessoas mais pobres das comunidades, das favelas da África, que não tinham nada... É, saírem para serem todos empregados na Accenture. Então, isso foi a coisa que me chamou muito a atenção e, e é incrível mesmo a experiência, como é que 98% dos alunos saem empregados para este tipo de emprego, é, onde o Maharishi vai até que eles fiquem empregados. Então, isso é uma das coisas que me chamou muitíssimo a atenção. Thank you, Teddy. Great, Denise. Yes, so I, I'm going to actually talk about some examples and I'll use Accenture as well about some of our students and then I thought to go quite deeply into just understanding our approach which is quite unique um, and, and explaining that. So um, since we first started, so as I said, um, I started in this work in 1995 um, but for the first four and a half years we just worked in very poor schools like in the equivalent of the favelas around Johannesburg. So um, we worked with uh, 9,000 young people I personally worked with. There was a, a team of us that worked with these 9,000 individuals. 
And then we were seeing these individuals coming out of high school, they would finish grade 12. And even though they were very motivated, etc., they had no money to go to university, they had no opportunities, they were ending up on the streets. And this was very heartbreaking for us. So then in the year 1999, we had this idea, could we create the first free, financially free university in South Africa? Because there were no free universities at that time. Now government has changed the law, so it's a little bit more like Brazil. But similar to Brazil, I think what you find in Brazil is that a lot of the free education from, from government, the more wealthy people in Brazil, uh, they can go for that kind of education, but the poorer people, they have to pay to go to the private institutions. And often the private institutions, the quality is not very good. Uh, sometimes it's very good, but then maybe they can't afford those institutions. And, and so we, we started from nothing, the first free university in the country. We had no money from government. Um, in fact, we've never received any money from government, the South African national government. Um, but up until now, we have taken, actually it's 22,000 young people that were unemployed that we have educated. 19,000 of them have completed their education and been placed in a job. So some may be left because of different reasons here and there, which uh, we, we can talk about, and that's a small percentage. Um, but 19,000 successfully you know, placed into a job. Now, why is that important to say? Because 70% of the students we bring in do not have university entrance from South African standards. So that means they've come through high school, they finished grade 12, but their academic results were so low or very, very poor that in South Africa, you have to meet a certain standard to be allowed to go into a public university. So 70% of these 19,000 did not have good enough marks to go into a public university, yet here they are working in South Africa's big companies and are extremely successful. So the other thing to say, which Denise likes because of the work she's done with Muleres de Brazil, et cetera, 70% of these individuals are women. We've always focused on women. Many of them have got their own young children. Many of them have had sexual abuse, have been violated, have had all kinds of terrible situations in their life. And they are stuck. They are really, really, really stuck. They can't make choices. They can't have freedom about which men they're going to be with or not be with. They don't have freedom about where can they work? How can they look after their children? There's so much desperation. So there's research that shows if you educate a woman, seven generations that follow her will be educated and that family can come out of poverty on an ongoing basis. So 70% of these are women, 70% of them did not have good enough marks that they can go to any public South African university. So really these figures on the screen here are a miracle by South African standards because South Africa's government has said, these people are not good enough. They're not intelligent enough to actually make it through a university. Yet they've come through four or five year degree programs are successfully placed in jobs and over 90% of them have maintained a job beyond the first year of job placement. And that's a very important statistic in South Africa because in South Africa, there are programs to get work experience for one year, but after one year, what happens? What is exciting is that over 90% of them have maintained a job for the long term. And you see here now they earn between them over 1.45 billion Rand in annual salaries. We estimate they'll earn over 41.9 billion Rand over their working careers. They support over 150,000 family members together between them. So this is Daddy, why we get up every day. Yes, Denise? What is 1.45 billion in, in dollars, more or less? You, you know, you can't really convert it. You, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to convert because our exchange rate is very weak. Um, but you, you could say like, say a billion dollars, even though it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not okay. that because of the exchange rate conversion. But in terms of the value in South Africa, you could say purchasing power parity, you know? Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and um, so it's very exciting because these were all unemployed people. Many, many, many have been exposed to violence. Some of these individuals have been in drugs and alcohol. Some have been in gangs. Some of them have even murdered people. And it's terrible to say that, but they have grown up in situations of extreme violence and poverty, gangs, et cetera. And then you see that their lives can be 100% rehabilitated. And this is the beauty of this approach to education. And I'm gonna explain, it was important for you to understand this and I'm gonna explain more about these students to understand why we have to go so deep with them because the damage to these individuals in their lives is so deep. 
When they come into us, there are many kind of careers. You can't see the screen here so carefully, but these are the kind of careers we want to develop young people for. So things like entrepreneurs, financial advisors, portfolio managers, risk assessors, treasurers, corporate financiers, accountants, um, uh, insurers, uh, conservation workers, uh, website developers, web designers, system support in IT, data analysts, statisticians, business advisors, consultants, uh, you know, film, uh, you know, people that can be going into uh, the media industries, uh, public administration, the public sector, banking, et cetera, et cetera. So these are some of the careers that we are developing young people for. And we've got graduates that have gone into all these different types of careers. I'm sorry, the writing is very small there. So what, what we do is in addition to a business degree, and I'll talk more about that, um, we do partner with companies. And one of the things that's quite unique about our model is we have a very, very close relationship with industry. And I would say a lot closer than a lot of the public universities in the country, the government universities. So for example, we partner with one of the biggest uh, short-term insurance companies called Bright. They're owned by the Fairfax uh, Group in Canada, a gentleman called Prem Watsa wonderful philanthropist and um, this is one of the biggest insurance groupings in the world but they are a major major partner of ours so we have a partnership with them where together we are training 1000 young unemployed people for the insurance sector and this company is committed to employ 1000 of our graduates um, so it's a very exciting partnership because these young people, if they can make it into the program and be successful in the program, they are guaranteed a job at the other end. And this company, Bright, helps to um, interview the individuals at the start of the program. So they say to them, we like you, we've interviewed you, you've met our requirements. If you can make it through this program, we will give you a job at the other end. Then we work with the biggest advertising agency in the country. They're part of a global US advertising agency. Um, uh, it's called Foot Cone, uh, Cone and Balding, but they are F FCB in South Africa, but they're part of the Interpublic Group, which is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, we partner with them on advertising and marketing. Then we partner with a global British company in the top 50 companies in the world called Experian around data science and data analytics. We partner with the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and Straight, which is the clearinghouse for the stock market, um, to train young people for the academy in financial markets. So these are young people to become stockbrokers, portfolio managers. Now you must understand our students, when they come in from the favelas, these students don't know we have stock markets. They don't know what is a derivative, an option, a future, a bond, equities, all this kind of thing. We have to teach them all of these things from scratch, but many of our graduates now are very, very senior across the financial markets across our country, in the stock markets, in the commodity houses, in all the banks, in <clears throat> across all, you know, right across the industry. Then we partner with Accenture and a company called Digital Solutions Group around outsourcing services. Uh, this is also a wonderful, wonderful vertical that we have um, that students can specialize in. So what makes Marishi Institute different? Um, first and foremost, and I'm gonna spend time on this because this is the core of the institution is that it is holistic. We call it consciousness-based education. It is about deep human transformation and to produce the kind of leaders and professionals with a type of life skills, somebody who really, really can cope in the world and has learned to deal with their inner world as well at the same time. Then we do an internationally recognized degree. This is with our partner, Marishi International University that you saw on the screen there. And so our students get a degree that is recognized in America, in South Africa, in Germany, in China, anywhere in the world. They can go work anywhere in the world with that degree. Then we have South African industry academies and all of these academies are run by the Marishi Invincibility Institute. So, um, you know, we have a team underneath, uh, you know, in the institution, uh, we have a staff now of about 100 staff across all of our different programs. And um, so we have faculty teaching insurance, teaching banking, teaching finance, teaching um, cybersecurity, all that kind of thing. And also teaching all the kind of business courses, finance, marketing, strategy, economics, um, communication skills, etc. And then the next thing that's, and the students also write, um, uh, uh, Nadine, there, yes. there is a question regarding how many uh, teachers we have, more or less. In, in, in South Africa? Yeah. 
we, we, we have about 40 full-time teachers, but then we have about 20 or 30 part-time teachers. And, and uh, other than that, we have all the Americans that teach. Um, That's right. And the Americans right? are professors who teach the final two years of the degree. So we do like a three plus two. Uh, the first uh, year is bridging. People from, uh, from the audience are asking if you can talk a little bit slower. A little bit slower. <laughs> OK, thank you. Great, thank you. OK, no problem. So the idea of uh, these industry academies um, is to really train young people for industries where there are jobs. So we, we must look in Sao Paulo. We must look in other parts of Brazil and say, especially at this time of COVID, when so many jobs are lost and uh, the economy is so tough, where are their jobs? Are there jobs in artificial intelligence, in machine learning? Are there jobs in, uh, in, in um, you know, uh, uh, in finance, but really in technology, in, 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 in fintech, um, et cetera? And then these are the areas where ultimately we should try and train young Brazilians for jobs in those areas uh, so, so they can get employed in those areas. And one of the ways that we do this as part of their studies is they write industry exams. So if they're studying um, you know, exams in finance, we get them to write the actual stock market exams. They also write things like, I don't know if you know, a CFA, Chartered Financial Analyst. Um, we do CFA level one for students who've come through our Financial Markets Academy. But then industry recognizes this. So it helps a lot to get a job. And number five is we also have all the students getting three years of work experience when they study with us. So students come for 10 hours in a day, but in that 10 hours, four hours is actually doing real work for real clients in a real company. So we have students working in Accenture, working in Bright, working in DSG, uh, working for Anglo-American, et cetera. But just for four hours a day, they get paid. But then that is incredible because it helps them learn why what they're learning in theory is useful in practice. And it learns them how to work in a real company and how to build a, a CV as well. And, and so work experience is very important. Industry exams are very important. And then that international status, but most important is the inner development. And I'm going to talk about that. And entrepreneurship, we also have every single student starts a business, even if they never want to be an entrepreneur, they all have to start a business. And we teach them right from informal trading. How can you sell food on the street? How can you sell anything? Okay all the way up to how can they run a more sophisticated business. So um, that is really what makes us different because most other universities in South Africa, they just offer a business degree, a computer science degree, that's it. But you don't get work experience, you don't do industry exams, you don't get international designations, and you don't do this inner development. So this is really how Marishi Institute does differ from conventional universities. Denise, was that clear? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the academies that we have and that we're growing where, where we think there's quite a lot of jobs, okay? Financial markets, cybersecurity. For example, in cybersecurity, which is online hacking, um, you, you, you know, we know that banks around the world, insurance companies are being hacked. You just saw some of the most famous people in the world, their Twitter accounts just got hacked. Um, who are the people that can stop that uh, hacking? Um, of, of uh, online digital information. So there's over 4 million jobs in the world available for cybersecurity specialists and cybersecurity analysts. So this is one of the areas that we think is, is a great opportunity. Then things like digital marketing. If you look at things like Facebook marketing, Google marketing, Google AdWords, things like that. There's a lot of jobs available if you can specialize in that kind of field. So we try and think where can we put students where they are likely to get jobs. So now uh, let me explain more about our students and more about our methodology. Denise, is it okay if I proceed? Yes, you go on. I am already answering some questions on the chat, so go on. Good. Okay. Wonderful. The things, the things I know, I will answer. The things I do not know, I will uh, interrupt you. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So 
I would just like to show, this is a picture of every year when students come in, okay? These are students from the favelas and the rural areas. They are very poor and we give them a test. They finished high school, they finished grade 12 um, and we give them a test in English and math and computer skills, just a standardized test. And it's a placement test to see for things that you cannot memorize at what level are these students between grade one down here at the left of this chart up to grade 12 at the right of the chart. And you can see that some of these students coming in are equivalent to grade one level in English, okay? So maybe they speak another language like Zulu or Tosa or Sutu, but in English, their language, English language skills is like a grade one, okay? Now all universities in South Africa are in English, okay? Now, no university would take somebody like that, but we will take them, okay? In, you, you'll see that 95% of these students on this chart, this is like just a normal intake for us, 95% of them are between grade one and grade eight level, okay? So it means out of 100 students, 95 are still primary school, okay? They're not like secondary school students. Even though they have finished secondary school, the quality of the education in secondary school was so poor that they're just unable to function at university level, but we will take them. So they're educationally disadvantaged, they're financially disadvantaged. But then what we've been finding for the last five years, we've been doing a test on something called post-traumatic stress disorder and chronic depression. We use something called the Beck Inventory uh, for chronic depression. It's a globally recognized test for depression. We use a test uh, for post-traumatic stress disorder called the PCL test. This is the same test that the US military use for war veterans who come back from Iraq or Afghanistan or any of the wars. And when they do this test, we find that you can see here 36% of our students, these are the same students that you saw on the previous slide, 36% have post-traumatic stress disorder at the same level as if they had fought in Iraq or Afghanistan in a war, okay? So they're walking around in hell. Okay, and I think you'll find many young women from the favelas might have the same situation. I don't know what the levels of violence are like, but in South Africa, there's a lot of violence. So young people have been attacked. They're living in fear of their lives. So they have post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay, they cannot get rid of that PTSD. You cannot get rid of PTSD just by going to gym or going for a run or, or going and having a nice holiday or you have 10 hours sleep at night you know, something like that. This is stress that is so deep, it's very hard to recover from it and to live a normal life or a high level kind of corporate job. 30% highly elevated levels of PTSD, but not the same as if they had fought in a war, but they are on the PTSD scale. So over 60% of these students are walking around in some kind of state of real internal suffering and misery. 40% are clinically diagnosed with depression and this is serious depression. So it's hard to get up in the morning to have a vision of what you want in the future and so on. So friends, what we've got to see is that these are young people that the public universities won't take. The public university is going to say these people are idiots. They're not good enough. Some of them are grade one level. Some of them are grade eight level. How could they ever cope at university? The public university system is going to say, how could you ever treat these people for their psychological disorders, the state of distress, et cetera, et cetera. Now, most programs uh, in South Africa that work with young people into higher levels of education, they only take the very best. The most elite programs take one in 100. The, the second level kind of programs will take 10 in 100, okay, of these very marginalized youth. We want to help 90 out of 100. We want to be there for everybody. We want to say that every human being is a genius waiting to happen and that we believe in every human being, that God made every human being to be great. Human beings don't have equal opportunities. Some grow up in terrible situations and their brain doesn't develop the same because of malnutrition, because of extreme trauma and stress and so on. But is it possible to rehabilitate these individuals so that they can also be great? Can they also become heads of banks and stockbrokers and software developers? And we say yes, and we were mavericks in South Africa because we stood up and started waving this flag to say these individuals are not lost to society. They can do more than being in a gang 
or just being a young woman who becomes pregnant at 18 or 16, drops out of school, can't do anything with her life. We say, no, that young woman, she could be the CEO of Barclays Bank one day. So how do we do it? In, in a nutshell, for us, education is a deep thing. It is all about human beings. It's all about that human being's heart, about their mind. It's about self-esteem, self-confidence. We call it inside out ed education. It's about inspiration. It's about passion. It's about love. So we have a curriculum that is very, very different to a normal curriculum. Our students come for 10 hours a day and they start off every day with yoga exercises. We've all done yoga, I'm sure, stretching, touching our toes, things like that. That's how students start. Uh, we do that for about 15 minutes. Then we do breathing exercises called pranayam, uh, just to balance the hemispheres of the brain. Then we do the most beautiful meditation program called Transcendental Meditation, and I'll talk more about that. And Flavia is a, a great expert in this. And then we have time for rest. Now you might think this is crazy. Imagine going to university and you have time every day where you just lie down and rest. Think that's crazy, but these young people know no silence. For them, they live in absolute squatter. They live with so much noise, gunshots and car engines and hooting all the time, 24 seven, music so loud, blaring, all this kind of thing. They don't know silence. They don't know silence, they don't know peace, etc. We use a lot of software in how we teach, reading software, math software, language software. Um, we give them real work. We feed them every day. We do counseling, a lot of sports and exercise. For us, it's really a holistic thing, which I'm gonna talk more about. But so I mentioned that bank ABSA that we're partnering with now. This bank have given us millions and millions and millions of rand, okay? Why do they give us so many millions? Because they have been amazed at the quality of staff that they have employed from the Marishi Institute. They, they never used to give us anything, okay? But now, you know, the head of equity derivatives in this bank is one of our graduates. The head of group strategy in this bank is one of our graduates. Uh, vice president of sales, one of our graduates. In money markets, one of our graduates. So in every single area, these are, were young unemployed people coming from the favelas. They are now very, very senior. And I could show you something similar in many of the banks in South Africa, all the biggest banks, um, in, in many of the telcos, et cetera, et cetera, that young people who were nobody in society are now very, very senior. Um, Denise spoke about Accenture. We've placed, placed now just under 200 people in Accenture. And when we first approached Accenture and Denise said, knows Accenture just don't hire you. They only hire from the best schools. And so they almost spat on the floor when we approached them. And I'm not joking. They were like, what? We could never employ your graduates, okay? These young people that come from nowhere, they don't fit our normal hiring requirements. Now they have nearly 200. Um, I often give this example, but I can give many examples like this. There's a global networking competition from Cisco. It has never ever been won by an African, not from Cape Town to Cairo has an African won this competition. Only been won by Americans, Chinese, Europeans, etc. maybe Brazilians. The first African who ever won, he was one of our students. He had never touched a computer before when he came to us. This guy now earns about 4 million Rand a year. He works for Vodafone, one of the biggest uh, cell phone companies, and he's very, very senior in, in IT there. So how do we do it? How do we make education work for everybody? How do we take this 90% of people in society that are really suffering, that are not normal traditional people that you think can be educated? Every one of those pictures there on the screen, look at those beautiful faces. Those are students of ours. Every one of them was an unemployed individual, often bitter, angry, unhappy, lost, depressed, you name it. Now you see them today, how they look, it's like a little flower that's been crushed and then that flower opens up and you can just see this beautiful human being inside and uh, they are incredible. And we are so proud of our graduates, but we do this because we look at a human being as a whole person and we use an approach called consciousness-based education or brain-based learning. Um, yes, we care about content and skills, but we care more, as I said, about metacognition, higher order thinking, enlightenment, developing the full person. 
and we care more about helping this individual discover why they were born. What is their life purpose? They have a reason that they're on earth. Why are they here on this earth? They were made for a reason. So when I went to university, the only thing they cared about was my intellect, okay? Can I read from the books? Can I understand the problems? Can I write the exams? Can I get X percentage mark? All that mattered was my intellect. Nobody ever cared at my university. Am I sick? Am I unhealthy? Am I depressed? Do I know who I am? Am I dealing with any kinds of issues inside my world? Doesn't matter. What matters is, have you got the textbook? Have you read the textbook? Did you write the exam? Did you pass your exam? But a human being is a multifaceted thing. And if we can make education multifaceted and really, really learn to see a human being as something, as a gift from God, as an unbelievable gift in the world, how can we develop that person in a holistic way? We'll have a completely different result. And that's what we set out to prove. So I showed you that our students had post-traumatic stress disorder. This is a study that came out at actually in 2019. It was published in an international journal called Psychology Reports. These are our students compared against one of the biggest and best, most famous public universities in South Africa, uh, like, um, like you will have in Sao Paulo, some of your big universities. This is called the University of Johannesburg. We took, uh, the researchers took uh, psychology students and business students at the University of Johannesburg. They also found some students in that university with post-traumatic stress disorder. And what they found is that at that university, you can see in 105 days, and in fact, in a whole year of just going to classes on psychology, going to classes on business, not one of those students came down in either depression or in post-traumatic stress disorder. At the Marish Institute, every single student that had post-traumatic stress disorder or depression came down below that blue line there. And so they were non-symptomatic. And this is now a published study we can share with you in, in, a, in, in a major global uh, psychology journal. And, and um, we're doing a lot more studies now on post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, et cetera, on students. But this is a very, very exciting result because it tells you that somebody is not fixed or lost just because somebody is suffering a lot now doesn't mean that they have to suffer forever in terms of inside their own heart and their own mind. For us, it's about a healthy body, mind and consciousness. How do we develop this whole person so that they can achieve anything? Okay, this human brain of ours is so incredible. It has a hundred billion neurons, each capable of 10,000 different connections. What matters is those connections between the neurons. And so how do you develop the connections between the neurons? When you learn mathematics, you start developing, especially from a young age, connections between those neurons. When you play the piano, you start to connect some of those neurons. When you learn how to speak in other languages, you're connecting some of those neurons. But how do you wake up that whole brain so all those possible connections can be formed. And this is when we talk about brain-based learning and this consciousness-based approach that, that we're talking about. So um, we mentioned that every single day our students do transcendental meditation, this meditation program. It's beautiful, it's effortless, it's natural. I'm gonna talk more about it. I have done it myself for now uh, about 30 years, this uh, technique. It has completely changed my life. And if there's time afterwards in the questions, I'll talk about what happened to me. Uh, but it absolutely changed my life. But this is just the picture of an individual and tracking their brain. Um, so if we have all these connections that I'm talking about in this previous slide, is it actually demonstrably possible to create these connections in the brain? And this is research showing, yes, it is possible. So this is an electroencephalograph EEG machine, and it's measuring the brain, the, the different lobes of the brain and it's measuring alpha, beta, theta, and delta waves in the brain. And you can see here, this is this individual when he's not meditating, okay? Just a normal individual, brain is quite incoherent. Wherever you see these little, what's called white spindles here, those little dots on the left-hand chart there, that is when there's some coherence, like a blip of coherence between the hemispheres of the brain, and then it shows up on the EEG machine. But then you can see this individual on the alpha frequencies after four months of practicing this transcendental meditation. And you can start to see a lot more coherence that is now happening in that um, uh, frequency of the brain after four months. Then you can see after two years, the brain is waking up. And you can see after 15 years, same individual, same brain, 
but many, many, many more of these connections are in place. And so you're starting to find this coherence in the brain. And this is why the person's becoming more creative, more happy, um, able to solve problems, able to focus better, able to study better, um, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a game-changing approach in education that we have found. This is a university uh, that we partner with in America that I showed you, the Marishi International University. Confidentially, uh, oh well, I won't even tell you which university is the control group here, uh, but it is known as the best or in the top three universities in the world. These are students at that university tested in IQ between year one to year four. No change. They come in and they kind of genius level IQ. You can see an average IQ there of 121. It's very high. Some of them probably 140, 150 IQ. You can see Marishi students coming in, not the same level of IQ, but IQ is going up. In a four year period, IQ is going up between nine to 14 points on average. It means you can develop the brain if you put focus on it. If you only focus on content and what you have to study in terms of content, you cannot develop the brain to the same degree in a holistic way. These are students at the Marishi School Daddy. in Iowa. Daddy. Yes. I, I remember when I met you, you used a phrase that I, I copy all the time. You said, um, it, uh, universities like Harvard, they make no change because it's genius in, genius out. That's I right. love the genius in, genius out. So they are exactly already right. very, very clever, already very rich, already very everything. And they go out after five years being more or less the same. So the real change is something very different from, from what we see in the, in the big, very uh, good uh, universities, right? Yes, uh, Denise, that's, that's a beautiful point and it's exactly right. It, it, it is, uh, you know, this is our traditional system of education. It's outside in, it's content based, it's uh, elitist. And uh, so actually that was Harvard in the previous study here. Um, Harvard takes the best of the best, um, but those individuals don't necessarily grow into their full potential. They're already the top. They're already the top one percentile of the population. But what could they become? And that's the question. What could they become? Whereas the, the Marishi approach, you know, anyone can come in, and but you see this very, very steep growth in, in, in the person. So to just bring in a person who's already a genius, I mean, that is, there's nothing great about that. It's easy to be elitist, you know? You can just say we take the cream of the crop and then of course they're gonna be successful or they're likely to be successful. But can you take the losers in society? Like the real losers, you know? This is what we have been doing now for 20 years. We have been taking the losers, okay? Now, the fact that they can win, those losers can win global competitions, they can be CEOs of big companies, they can be directors of big companies. How is that possible? It's possible because every human being has infinite potential. Every human being's got infinite potential. And that's really what education should be. And that's what Aristotle spoke about and Socrates and the great founders of education. It was how do you lead the genius out of the person? And, 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 and develop that genius. Now, this one single slide is what got me passionate about this field of consciousness-based education because I heard about this little school in Iowa that no one had ever heard about with a weird name called the Maharishi School of the Age of Enlightenment. And you just hear that name and you think, gee, that's gotta be some very, very weird school, okay? This school for over 20 years Anybody can come to the school and they come in and it's the 50th percentile of all Americans. And after four year, five years, by the time they're in grade 12, these children have gone from your average American, like Donald Trump, to the top 1% of all Americans. And that is an incredible achievement. And, and you can just imagine, and this is why we see these students going on afterwards to Harvard and Stanford and everywhere else. These were just average people, just average people who became exceptional because of this kind of brain-based approach to education. And this approach was founded by this individual called Maharishi. And that's why we name our institute Maharishi Institute. Uh, and Maharishi brought out this approach of consciousness-based education to develop the full potential of every person. And I'm gonna talk a lot more about that. 
This is technology-based learning. So we use a lot of technology in our learning. And so we know learning is gonna be influenced by artificial intelligence, virtual reality, augmented reality, et cetera, et cetera. And what we always say to people is that we believe that the future of education, I'm gonna come on to that, the future of education is gonna be a combination of two things. It's gonna be in one word, mass personalization. So education is gonna become increasingly personalized. So what is unique about Denise? What is unique about Flavia? How does Tanya learn? How does Rose learn? Everybody's gonna learn in a different way. So, um, and then it's going to be about, so it's gonna be about personalization and how are we gonna get there? Through the best methods of developing the individual. So I would call it human technologies. And then the best digital technologies, which is kind of the digital or technology revolution. And I think it's gonna be a marriage between those things, that the future of education is going to be, how do you develop the human brain in the fastest and best possible way? And how do we couple modern technology using things like gamification and MOOCs and e-learning and things like that together to create a much faster growth in an individual and in a personalized way? I just wanna say what we do at the Marshall Institute is we help only disadvantaged youth we get a lot of money raised by companies, uh, but then what we do is it goes into a sustainable fund. The individual comes in, they only have to pay a very small amount. Our students pay $12 per month. They get food every day, lunch every day. They get, we have a breakfast support program. We have a dinner support program. They get all books, all materials. They, we take them on leadership camps. They get mentors, they get counselors, et cetera, et cetera. But, they only pay $12. But then what happens is we have them working. So for example, we have our own functioning call center and we run the call center for one of the biggest food outlets in South Africa called Nando's. And so for example, last year, last year our students took 1.4 million food orders for this company called Nando's, generated about 800 million rand of revenue for this company. And then people all over the country would phone in and order food. It would be delivered to their house. Um, but in the process, the students earning money and then they pay part of that money, what we call, we call pay it forward. So what we do is that in the cycle, maybe this company like Barclays pays for the student. This is an unemployed young girl called Tuwana. She comes from Soweto. She can't go to university. She's just stuck. She comes in, we educate her, we give her a job. She pays back half of what we uh, uh, cost to educate her by the time she graduates. She actually did go to America and do a master's degree at MIU. But then when she's working, she also then continues to pay uh, a percentage of her salary, a very, very small percentage, under 10%, it's about 5%. And then she funds another student. So what happens is Barclays funds Tawana, but Tawana funds John. And then John is gonna fund Jane. So every student funds another student, and that's how we make the model more sustainable, which I can talk about. Our, our dream, this is my final slide, um, is just to say that our, our dream is uh, to ultimately educate uh, 19, uh, ultimately educate 100,000 people over the next uh, you know, two decades, three decades. Uh, we've already educated 19,000. But 100,000 people could earn over their working careers 1 trillion rand if we can get them into the right sectors of the economy, if we can produce the right kind of entrepreneurs, et cetera. And those are 100,000 people who would be unemployed, but they could support a million people between them. So that is our vision. That's what we would be very excited to work uh, together with Rose and Flavia, Denise, et cetera, in uh, Brazil to help build this kind of a dream. And uh, yeah, let's do something big in Brazil. I think that that will be very exciting. So I'm going to stop, Denise. Uh, maybe there's questions. I'm very sorry I took so long. No, this is wonderful to hear from you. We are, we are, uh, sorry, I'm switching to Portuguese. A gente está ouvindo uma porção de comentários muito interessantes aqui no chat. Já fui aproveitando e respondendo algumas perguntas que eu sabia. Tem algumas para vocês responderem daqui a pouco. Mas eu queria abrir é, para a Rose falar um pouco do que, que ela acha de similaridades com isso que acontece na África e com a nossa situação de educação no Brasil, Rose. Ok, Denise. Eu só vou pedir para o Ted tirar a tela. 
Ted, Teddy, can you can you sure. stop screen so we see? Perfect. Okay. Sorry, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Legal, legal. É, bom, os problemas tem tem várias coisas em comum aí, né, do que o Ted está falando, mas a gente precisa começar com uma coisa que é muito triste que a gente tem parecido que é a desigualdade, né? A gente tem uma desigualdade enorme nesse país e a gente precisa tornar essa desigualdade visível. Enquanto a gente, é, como sociedade, a gente não enxergar para isso, como o Ted colocou de maneira muito clara, eu acho que a gente não avança. Então, a gente tem, como país, Ted, essa similaridade, tá? A gente também é um país de muito desigual e isso a gente precisa tornar claro. A gente entendendo isso a gente abraça um projeto maravilhoso igual o seu, foi o que eu fiz em 2012, quando eu e minha família, nós resolvemos olhar para essa desigualdade com todo o nosso privilégio de elite branca, como é que a gente podia ajudar na diminuição dessa desigualdade. Foi aí que montamos a FEDU, que eu também venho com uma trajetória muito grande em formação é, de professores, sou psicóloga, sempre, sempre é, busquei muito estudar como que a gente consegue diminuir essa desigualdade, seja pelo campo de uma formação é, acadêmica ou para uma formação muito de habilidades socioemocionais. Cheguei a um, a um momento da minha vida né, e falei, vou parar tudo e vou montar uma própria faculdade que tenha por objetivo a diminuição de desigualdades. E aí eu já vejo outra coisa parecida, Denise. Se a gente é muito parecida a nível de desigualdade de país, nós somos parecidos, a FEDUC, Faculdade de Educador, é muito parecida em propósito. Porque nós dois temos a certeza que uma educação atrasada aumenta a desigualdade. Então a FEDUC vem com esse propósito de acolher alunos da educação básica pública nossa, porque são alunos que têm um gap muito grande, né? e uma impossibilidade de ter acesso ao ensino superior, nós possibilitamos esse acesso. Então, esse é o nosso recorte, o recorte da FEDU, que é trabalhar com alunos que são da educação básica pública, que não têm condição de acesso ao ensino superior. Isso foi um primeiro desejo nosso, a gente já tem seis turmas, é uma faculdade mantida pela família, é, nós temos muito, né, desde 2012, muita gente querendo se associar a nós, mas a gente nunca viu, Ted, essa, essa verdadeira necessidade de diminuir desigualdade. Tá? Os projetos são maravilhosos, né, de instituições que querem fazer parceria com a FEDUC, mas a gente nunca viu uma coisa tão parecida com a gente. Quando a Denise falou do, do, do Maharishi, eu falei, a Denise falou, Rose, aí, agora sim, agora tem algo que é muito parecido, né? É uma instituição que conhece o que é desigualdade, sabe o que é ser desigual nesse país e tem realmente uma intencionalidade de diminuir essa desigualdade por meio de uma formação. Então, eu acho que eu vejo muita similaridade, sim, Denise, tanto a nível maior de país, porque o Ted sabe né, dessas dificuldades, ele está num país desigual, a gente não pode trazer é, projeto de um país que não tem desigualdade para um país desigual. Já vem uma diferença muito grande. Então, eu estou muito feliz com essa parceria. Eu acho que tem muita gente querendo mais ouvir o TED do que a mim mesmo, entendeu? Então, vamos... É, e eu tenho que dizer também que o Jorge, a Cris e o Du Beira, é, que são sócios lá da, da IP, né? são da, da família acionista da IP, é, tem, uma, tem um propósito muito grande também neste tipo de trabalho social, então eu acho que a gente juntou aqui e vai juntar ainda muito mais gente, com certeza, que tem esse propósito e que enxerga isso, né? Flávia, conta pra gente aí essa mágica da meditação, como é que a gente tem... É as pessoas mais, é, vamos dizer assim, emocionalmente doentes e às vezes corporalmente doentes entrando e saem genius out. Como é que é essa mágica? É, esse é um diferencial desse conhecimento que o TED aplica lá na Maharishi Institute, que é a educação baseada na consciência, a gente utiliza a técnica da meditação transcendental, que é uma técnica milenar, Maharishi, ele trouxe essa técnica para a gente, para o Ocidente, ele era físico, e como era físico, viu que era uma área científica, então precisava comprovar os efeitos através da ciência. Então a gente tem muitas pesquisas 
mostrando o que acontece no cérebro quando uma pessoa pratica essa técnica de transcendência, o que acontece na fisiologia. Né? Então, a gente vê que os, o estresse, por exemplo, ele desativa a nossa área do córtex pré-frontal, que é responsável pelo julgamento, pela tomada de decisões, é, criatividade, enfim. E ativa mais uma área do cérebro, que é a amígdala, que é o centro do medo. E aí, com medo, o medo dá uma paralisada, a gente não consegue avançar muito. Então, essa tecnologia de meditação, que é diferente de outros tipos de, de meditação, porque ela não exige concentração nem contemplação, e também proporciona um repouso fisiológico mais profundo do que o sono profundo. Esse repouso fisiológico que é capaz de eliminar as impressões que ficam profundamente enraizadas no sistema nervoso. Então, uh, aquele estresse de pós-traumático, soldados pós-guerra, é, as mulheres que sofrem uh, os abusos, enfim. É, claro, tem os estresses mais fortes, mas também tem esses que a gente está... Hoje o Brasil é um dos países mais uh, ansiosos e depressivos uh, da América Latina. Então, se a gente for olhar para o lado da saúde... Né? Então, a gente está vivendo, principalmente agora com a pandemia, esses índices têm piorado, principalmente entre, entre os jovens, é, aumentando o suicídio, automutilação. E aí, quando a gente fala de educação, né? então, a gente, o Brasil hoje, quase 80% é, são analfabetos funcionais. Você pode saber ler, pode saber escrever, mas você não consegue entender o que você está lendo. Então, é, o que essa meditação faz é aumentar a nossa capacidade de aprendizagem, a melhorar a memória, a desenvolver aquelas habilidades que o, o TED fala, né, que a gente precisa, que é melhorar a nossa capacidade de resolução de problemas, através da criatividade, aumento do QI provado pela ciência, que aumenta a nossa a, a inteligência... Então, é uma técnica que é muito simples, é muito fácil, por isso qualquer um consegue, independente de é, nível social, cultural, é, intelectual, crianças hiperativas conseguem, nem elas acreditam, porque é uma técnica mecânica, automática e sistemática, é muito simples, mas muito poderosa, né? Então, porque vai a, a, a atingir, a conectar, a nossa mente consciente na origem, né, na fonte dos pensamentos, na consciência pura. Então, é, através dessa tecnologia e de outras técnicas mais avançadas, é que a gente consegue fazer com que o aluno consiga realmente aprender. Né? A gente pode dar melhor conteúdo, se a mente não estiver preparada para absorver aquele conteúdo, ela não consegue absorver. Uh, então, é, através desse, dessa educação baseada na consciência que a gente vai conseguir atingir todos esses resultados que o TED tem falado aí. Né? Eu, faço, eu sou vice-presidente do Instituto David Lynch aqui no Brasil, que é de uma fundação, uh, tem a fundação americana, do cineasta americano, e que ele tem levado isso para o maior número de pessoas em situações de risco nos Estados Unidos, Uh, e os efeitos na escola, nas notas, a diminuição da violência, da criminalidade, e, enfim, isso também é uma realidade nas escolas que adotam essa tecnologia dentro do, do estudo acadêmico. Né? Lavinha, quanto tempo precisa por dia para fazer meditação, para você ter todos esses resultados? Olha, é, para a gente poder ter todos esses resultados aí que o TED colocou, uh, seria importante ter uma, um, algo, a gente ensina algumas posturas de yoga, a gente ensina é, alguns uh, exercícios de respiração. Então, assim, a meditação mesmo, é de 15 a 20 minutos, dependendo da idade, tá? E aí a gente é, incorpora com alguns outros exercícios, porque às vezes o estresse, a tensão está muito profunda, e aí a yoga, os exercícios do corpo, ajudam a dar uma flexibilizada nas impressões, nos nozinhos, 
E aí a meditação consegue dissolver mais profundamente aqueles estresses mais enraizados. Uhum. Então, uh, se a gente for fazer o TED, ainda ele aplica uma técnica mais avançada, e aí no total deve dar uma hora, uma hora e meia, todo o exercício. Né? Uhum. Mas a gente, com 15, 20 minutos, já dá para começar e ter bons resultados, que é o que, o que acontece nas escolas uh, públicas lá nos Estados Unidos, o tempo que eles utilizam é esse. É, é mais ou menos isso. Eu me lembro, Ted, que na África, na África do Sul, quando eu estive lá, eles chegam, fazem meditação uns 20 minutos de manhã, logo às 8 da manhã, e mais uns 20 minutos antes de ir para casa, até para descansar e poder enfrentar, porque eles também lá enfrentam duas, três horas de condução até chegar na casa deles, que é uma coisa bem parecida com as grandes cidades aqui, para quem mora nas comunidades longe, né, Ted? Hum. É... Ted, conta para gente uma coisa interessante that, que eu ouvi de that, você. Right. O que, que aconteceu com o nível de criminalidade no centro de Joanesburgo, algum tempo depois que você colocou o Instituto Maharishi lá no centro e todo mundo começou a meditar no Instituto? O que, que aconteceu com o Em Volta, com a cidade, com o centro okay. de Joanesburgo, que eu achei muito interessante? Okay, yeah, this, this, this is an incredible uh, thing. Is, is the sound coming through okay, Denise? Yes, yes. Sound, sound is there. And just, I, uh, I just want to say thank you to Rose. Vocês estão me ouvindo? Porque tem gente dizendo que não está me ouvindo direito. Vocês ah. estão me ouvindo? Ah, tá ok. Ok. okay. Mm -hmm. You can hear. Everything's good. I just wanted to say a big thank you to Rose for the wonderful words she was saying about her journey and uh, what she's done in creating for Duke. It's just so impressive and beautiful. And it's, it's such an honor that we can partner together. And also to Flavia for these incredible words, uh, also about conscious-based education. And it's so great to have an expert like this in uh, right there in Sao Paulo. So uh, thank you very much. And um, so uh, to D D D D Denise's question, um, Denise, just can you ask again? Uh, the, the question was, what happened to the environment around the yes. building, downtown Johannesburg, when we okay. st you started doing inside the university? Okay, so firstly, there is research in various parts of the world, for example, in Washington, D.C., in a very, very down and out area. You know, there's a lot of inequality and poverty actually in Washington, D.C., and um, where, where they started a university and then um, just because you know, a university is training young people uh, and it's got a positive intention and uh, you know, it's focused on uh, careers and developing entrepreneurship and creativity and so on. Um, what tends to happen is that um, you start to get coffee shops and bookshops and all kinds of positive productive activities, whereas before maybe there was not, not, not so much in that area. So there's a lot of research in the world that if you can make a successful university in a down and out area, um, you can start to change that area around a great deal. Um, so that's in general, that's just in general, that education in and of itself is positive, it is a nurturing thing and so on. But then what is so unique about consciousness-based education is that firstly what is happening is on the one side the brain is developing like we were showing all those connections forming in the brain, but it is one of the most powerful methods as, as I was talking about to reduce uh, stress, anxiety, trait anxiety, um, all, all kinds of um, you know, mental disorders and create a much greater sense of inner peace and happiness and so on. And many people, you know, learn to meditate just because they want to feel more happy, uh, more peace and so on. And certainly in my own life, that is something that's completely and utterly changed. I mean, uh, Denise was talking about ADD and things like that. When I was young, I mean, I couldn't focus. I was jumping around. It, it, it was just so difficult to study. And then I actually, um, I was doing actuarial exams and you know, I was failing. My professor kept saying to me, you're never gonna be an actuary. And I won't tell the whole story, but I ended up learning TM and uh, then this advanced TM as well. And I, I ended up passing all 10 actuarial exams through the Institute of Actuaries in London. 
Um, I passed all 10 exams in two years, which is quite unheard of. Uh, these are some of the most difficult exams in the world. And um, I also did my honors degree at university at the same time. And I was the top honors student in the country. And my professor was so shocked. And he literally said to me, I told this to Denise, he said to me, how did an idiot become an actuary? Because uh, he said, it's, it's not, not, not possible. And, um, and at the same time, not only had I really developed this ability in my own self to focus, to concentrate like a laser beam. I mean, I can concentrate and I'm not kidding. You know, I, I work, I don't know, ridiculous hours. I get up at two, three in the morning. Uh, you know, I'll meditate. I start working super early, long before the family's awake. Um, I'm always working. I'm working on so many projects for national government in the school system, et cetera. I'm like Denise, I'm a workaholic, I'm passionate, I love life, but I can just keep going the whole day, focusing, dealing with all kinds of things to a tremendous degree. But, and what has changed as well in me is that I found this tremendous amount of inner peace and inner happiness. And when I was young in my early twenties, I was really, really quite depressed and, uh, uh, there was one point in my life when I was actually quite suicidal. I was just thinking, life is not worth anything. Everybody's miserable. You know, there's nothing I want to live for. You know, there's nothing worthwhile. You know, all this kind of thing. And after just really two years of meditating, that really changed inside me. And I started to find reasons why I wanted to live. You know, a lot of young people today, they don't really understand why they should even be alive, you know? And I think many young people and even wealthy people's children, you know, are having the same problems. Uh, they're demotivated. They don't really have drive. They can't focus. They, you, you know, all, all, all this kind of thing. It's very, very, very common. I mean, certainly in South Africa. And, um, and so I, I found that that changed a great deal in me. And mm -hmm. so, but, but then there's this extraordinary byproduct of meditation that when, when an individual starts to change inside themselves and experience greater peace inside themselves and things like that, it starts to spread in society. And it's just this weird thing because when you are happier than the people who are around you, just it, they become happier. When you're very stressed and unhappy, people around you are unhappy. So what happens is when you start to create a university where everybody is becoming much more happy, much more peaceful, much more excited, much more passionate, uh, you know, starting to solve great problems, achieve great things. There's a whole new energy and you start to find that that energy spreads in society. And literally, literally speaking, and there's over 60 scientific studies done on this, International Journal of Conflict Resolution, all kinds of studies, it's very hard to understand at a logical level with the kind of paradigm that we used to. But what starts to find, uh, what starts to happen is in the vicinity of great energy, coherence, happiness, um, peace, etc. cetera, that starts to spread in society and you start to find violent crime and things like this go down. And so actually in the city center of Johannesburg, where we are, violent crime has fallen over 90%. We started working, when I first started working in one of the worst favelas. This had the highest, there's a road called London Road Alexandra where I started working. My mother cut out of the newspaper. I was just 27 years old working in this township. I was one of the only white people going into a township, all black, everybody, you know, all these big black people every day around me. I'm this little guy, you know, four people rocked my car, nearly killed me the first day I went in and, 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 and so on. My mother cut out of the newspaper, London Road Alexandra has the highest murder rate in the whole world of any road in the world. And I was up and down driving this road every single day in my car when we started working in schools. This is before we started the first free university. I'm this young actuary management consultant. I'd been earning over a million rand a year. I'd never been into a place like that. <clears throat> Within three and a half years of us working in that township, training 9,000 students to meditate, violent crime had fallen over 90% in, in, in that area. It was really, really extraordinary. Johannesburg used to be one of the, <clears throat> was known as the murder capital of the world. And then <clears throat> in recent figures, it hasn't been in the top 50 murder capitals in the world. And um, so this is a byproduct. It's, it's just, you can create an educational institution that is so beautiful that it starts to create, it's like a lighthouse in the night, in the dark night, and it starts to just, radiate light around it. And this is what we want, uh, I, I, I think. 
Uh, Teddy, lots of questions. Well, we have to be here like four hours because so many <laughs> questions. <laughs> but um, uh, let's talk about the money part. It's very important and we have a lot of questions. What's the, what's the idea of the money? How much does it cost to have a student? Who pays? Does the government pay anything? How do you get the money? Where, where is the most, um, um, sorry. Então, quem é que paga? Se o governo paga? Como é que é toda a estrutura financeira que suporta o Instituto hoje? É, e, e quais são as, as maiores dificuldades que você tem? Tem uma pergunta aqui. A maior dificuldade que você tem é conseguir dinheiro para colocar tudo isso em, 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 em andamento? Fala um yeah. pouco, então, da parte financeira. Ok, yeah, finances, it's uh, very, very important in a project like this. And if you want to make it great and grow, then you have to find ways to make it sustainable. And um, so firstly, on the cost side, let me just uh, put in perspective that we work very, very hard to be ultra low cost. Um, I always call it getting to ultra, is how could we be the lowest cost university in the whole world, but offer a world-class education? And Rose can tell you, education is expensive because you have to pay teachers. They're not going to just only breathe air. They want to, you know, be paid proper paychecks, um, or, or all this kind of thing. And um, so, how can you create to be very, very low cost? Um, so let me just put in perspective: the Ivy League universities in America, um, you know, the best of the best. So Columbia University, for example, in New York. Uh, is about $85,000 if you're going to do something like, um, you know, some of the scientific uh, degrees and, and so on. A Harvard degree, maybe $55,000, $60,000 a year. Any of these Ivy League universities, you're looking at, say, $55,000, $60,000, um, up to even $80,000 per year. So for a four-year degree, uh, you might be paying $240,000 up to $300,000. In, in America, the average private college uh, or private university, uh, because we are a private uh, institution, the average private university, the tuition fees are $33,000 a year in the United States, which is crazy, but they're the most expensive educational system in the world. Um, and it, it, it's a ridiculously high cost. Then in South Africa, the cost of a public institution, if you pay the fees for a public institution, including you know, your food every day, your books, your materials, tuition, everything else, you're looking at about um, four to 5,000 US dollars per year, okay? So it's about one-tenth of the cost of an Ivy League in the United States, um, but that would be a public university where you have to pay, and um, uh, that would be the cost. Our current cost right now is about $1,600 per student per year, but that includes all books, all materials, food, um, uh, the, the transcendental meditation, the advanced programs, yoga. Uh, we take the students on leadership retreats. Um, uh, we have counseling, mentorship, sports activities, etc. cetera. Um, but we are working to get that cost down in the next few years to $1,000 per student per year. And our goal is to get to $500 per student per year. $500 per student per year is like $2 per day, basically. That is our target. So can we get the cost down to as low as $2 per day? So that is on the cost side of the equation. So then there's the revenue side of the equation. Well, how are we going to finance you know, that money? Okay, so if it's $5 a day, $4 a day, you know, can we get it down to $2 a day? The idea is, can the student even pay $1 a day? Okay, does the student have anything? Okay, so at the moment we are charging $12 per month, you know, and the reason we don't make it completely free to the student, we say to the student, even if you work in McDonald's on a weekend, try and get a little bit of money so you can value your education. Because if somebody gets something absolutely for free, now I don't know about Brazil, and it might be different culturally, but in South Africa, if no, you get something same. for free, it's so the same. same. You, yeah. you tend to not value it. So, and what's interesting about poor people is they still, they want the best brands, 
poor people in South Africa, they want to wear Nikes, they want to wear the best clothes, they want to wear Gucci, whatever they can possibly get. Um, last, last model of cellular phone. Exactly, the best cellular phone, the best shoes, you know, things like that. So even though they're poor, they're still very brand conscious. And, um, but if you give somebody something for nothing, then they think this thing is worthless. Okay. And so an important part of getting attitudes right, because attitude is everything. Attitude is more important than even in anything else. Like how good a person is at maths or English that you can fix. But if attitude is terrible, that is what you've got to change. Okay. So you've got to do a lot of work on attitude. And we do a lot of work on attitude. Like our students have to clean the school. So they, they have to get a bucket and spade and get on their hands and knees and clean the floors and things like that. Because this is part of being humble and of actually learning what it takes to one day be a great person, you know? And so we have to knock arrogance out and ego out. And it has to be really this idea that you get there by working hard and developing your full potential. And that is not gonna be just because I don't know, you just do some quick thing, like you steal a cell phone or something like that. That's gonna put you in jail. It's gonna destroy your whole life, you know? So, so really attitude is very, very, very important. And then part of that is students must pay something. So they must help to clean the school. They must help to run the school. They must get a job. They, they must also like give back in their communities. So we have reached about 700,000 young people across the country that our university students go and teach in their holidays. So we are saying to them, you don't have a lot of money now, okay? But one day you will have a lot of money, okay? And when you have got money or when you are earning money, you must give some of that money to help somebody else. Right now you don't have money. We're gonna ask you for just $12. How are you gonna get that $12? You can work in McDonald's, you can work in a car wash, you can get it from a school teacher. You can find a lost uncle who can help you with that $12. But very soon, we're gonna give you a job when you've got good enough skills and then you'll be earning maybe $100 or $200 in a month. So the $12 is easy to pay. But now that you don't have a lot of money, what do you have? You have energy, we want you to go back to your high school and go teach other people and inspire them. So what's very important in our views, don't give the students everything for nothing. They must work hard, they must give back to other young people who are also in gangs, who are also suffering in their high schools. They can go and teach maths, they can go teach computers, they can go and teach entrepreneurship, anything. It doesn't matter, but when you teach somebody else, you learn, okay? so. That's the first part of bringing income in this model is it mustn't be completely free to the students, okay? And when you give the students a job, so if they start to work for Itaú Bank or they work for Barclays Bank or somebody like that, we say 50% of what they earn must go towards funding another student, okay? And when they graduate, they must pay it forward. So we charge our students 600 Rand a month, even if it takes them 10 years when they're working, but they must fund another student, okay? So every single cent that we get from ABSA Bank for this student, ultimately that student pays back, even if they don't have the money now, okay? But they're gonna go teach in their community, they're gonna clean the floors, they're gonna run the library. So you don't need a lot of staff because your students become your staff. So students must do everything. They must install software, they must put in antivirus software, they must manage your computer labs, manage the library, they must go and teach in their communities and have community projects. They must help with feeding schemes, work with orphanages, all this kind of thing. Okay. Now you're starting to build great attitudes, okay? So that's the first method of getting money is that every student ultimately pays and they pay through running the school, they pay through working in the community and they pay the little bit that they can and then later on when they've got more money, they do pay because when that person becomes wealthy, many of our graduates are millionaires now. Why shouldn't they help other people when they're millionaires? You know, somebody helped them. And so th th that's the first principle about the money. The second principle is, is we, we, we try and say, how can we leverage technology and leverage the students work to bring down the costs because technology can allow you to have very high quality and reach a lot of people and reach scale. So technology is a very, very important piece of the puzzle. Also, many, many big companies have a lot of wasted assets, okay? So we have set up now, I mean, you know, by now it's seven universities, like buildings, just taking 
office furniture from big companies that it's sitting in a warehouse because Barclays Bank or Microsoft, they now want for their staff to have these beautiful tables and chairs. Um, they want to have a new color scheme. They change the brand. Everything of the old stuff goes into a big warehouse. What happens to that stuff? Okay, so we work with all of our corporate partners to find clothing for our students to wear. So all the business professionals, like the women are wearing beautiful clothes, but then when they change those clothes or they don't wear those clothes anymore, they donate them. We have a clothing library. So all of our, all of our students must wear nice clothes, but they can't afford those nice clothes, but we get them those clothes from our corporate partners. But they have to come every day dressed like a professional and we help them get those clothes. But many people have clothes in their wardrobes that they're not using, okay? They can give those clothes to the students and, and then the students can take those clothes out for job interviews, almost like you take a book out of the library, they can take the clothes out of the library. Then, then um, so similarly, we find all these tables, chairs, office partitions, etc. Then people like Microsoft are wonderful supporters of ours. So Microsoft donate all of our software. So we have Microsoft Office software, as many licenses as we want for 10 years. So all of our students learn in a Microsoft environment, but it's also good for Microsoft because we've produced thousands of IT professionals who now love Microsoft and they can program in Microsoft and you know, .NET and, 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 th and things like that. And, um, and they can have MCSE and MCSD and all these Microsoft qualifications. So it is also good for corporate partners to partner with these youth because one day those youth are gonna buy Microsoft software when they're working for Barclays Bank. And when they are the CIO at Barclays, they are gonna buy Microsoft software. So there is a win-win partnership that you can have with every single type of company. This is what one has to do, okay? Then of course- so, Very interesting, muito interessante que vocês têm um custo de 1.600 dólares por aluno por ano, incluindo tudo, tudo, até os off-sites e tudo, comida. E no Brasil, as universidades públicas devem custar mais do que isso por mês por aluno. Então, toda essa, essa mecânica de deles trabalharem das, das doações, das partnerships, é o que barateia muito. E é incrível pensar que vai conseguir baixar esse custo para 500 dólares por ano. Isso realmente nos deixa muito animados, porque isso é o que a gente precisa no Brasil para poder expandir né? É, é, você ia falar mais alguma coisa, até de eu te cortei. Yes, and then, Denise, we've also done some very, very innovative things. Now, um, you know, it would be very good to look into government law in Brazil. In South Africa, unfortunately, we're a private, uh, non-profit institution, so we cannot get any funding from the state. However, the state have legislated something called black economic empowerment to, because you know, um, when, when Mandela came into power, he started that program. And the idea was that all of the wealth and all of the power in the country was controlled by white people. And so how could black people be brought into the economy? And I won't go through all the laws that they brought out in government, but we found very, very strategic ways of leveraging these laws so that we're able to help young black people to get a great education and, and so on. And that has brought us many, many millions in funding. So if we just spent time deeply, but I'm sure Rose understands this and many uh, you know, people in Mulheres de Brazil and, and so on, understanding all the different government legislation, where are the angles, where are the opportunities, you will find ways to bring in income through even if it's not direct government funding, just ways of leveraging the government's laws. And so yeah. one of the exciting things we've done is through leveraging this black economic empowerment, we've been able to get um, share equity actually now in 25 companies. So, so we, our university owns say maybe 25% of the biggest advertising agency in the country. And whenever this advertising agency declares profits, we get 10% of those profits that they declare as dividends. So that's one of the very, very interesting things we've done. And we own stakes in Experian. It's this big credit uh, company. Um, we, we own stakes in Bright, this insurance company. We own 25% of this insurance company, um, et, et cetera, et cetera. And so we, we steadily doing things to build an endowment, 
because we're hoping that this university can be there in a hundred years time. But it's, it's a long discussion and we can talk about, so we have about five major methods of, of uh, generating income and uh, we can talk more about that. But all of it comes yeah. through creating shared value, which is how do you create a win-win partnership? It mustn't ever be that Microsoft just give you software and you don't give Microsoft anything back in return. So if Microsoft give you software, how do you create double that value for Microsoft? not just in good PR and, you know, the staff feel good about it and things like that, but how do you create real hard value for Microsoft? That requires real thought. And this is what we try to do is we try to go into every single partnership as a long-term sustainable partnership where many of our partners have been with us for 10 years, 15 years, things like that. But we give them as much value back as they give to us. Now you think, how can a little nonprofit that has nothing to give how can it give value to a giant like a Microsoft or a Cisco or an Intel or something? You'll be surprised. And once you start to really brainstorm this, you start to realize that you can create beautiful synergies and, and, and shared value between the two organizations. Tenho que contar para vocês que nas semanas que eu tive lá, por acaso, estava tendo uma reunião que o Ted me convidou para participar de Xereta que era com uma organização chamada Young's President Organization, que são as grandes empresas que têm é, presidentes jovens. E eles estavam todos na sala, e eu pude assistir, perguntando como é que eles fazem para fazer parte, como é que eles fazem para doar, como é que eles fazem para poder contratar os alunos. Yeah. Então, ele não corre atrás do dinheiro, as empresas correm atrás dele, é uma coisa impressionante. Então, Ted, a gente queria realmente. Yeah, it took us some years, Denise. I'll just say on yeah, this. Yeah, I know. It was I know. Very, very hard. In the beginning, it yeah. was very, very hard. Everybody thought we were crazy, and nobody would support us. But yeah. now it's 20 years later, and I'm not joking. I get people phoning me up and saying, "I want to give you money." People that I've yeah. never met before. They say, yeah. "I know what you do. I've seen what you do. Yeah. I want to give you money." And we just say, "Okay, here's the bank account." <laughs> Uh, Ted, um, so can you tell us, uh, it's lovely to have you all here. I would like to go on and on forever. And I, I see that nobody moves. Everybody's still here listening to us after Thank almost you. two hours. So it's great. I'm But sure everybody's to finish, hungry. We are going to have other, other Zooms for, for sure to discuss more and more. But to finish, it would be great if you can tell us um, what are, um, desculpa. Denise em português. É, desculpa. Para terminar, o melhor seria dizer o que, que são os desafios que vocês enfrentaram no início e que provavelmente a gente vai enfrentar agora e quais são os desafios que vocês agora que já estão bem na frente estão enfrentando. Então a gente queria super ver, ver, ver você assim muitas vezes aqui conversando com a gente, mas eu acho que para wrap up hoje a gente termina com a coisa dos Great. desafios. Yeah, the first thing to say is that no challenge is insurmountable. If if you really are passionate and committed, you can achieve this. You can definitely achieve this. And uh, so you have to decide, you know, this is what I'm going to do. It's like jumping off a cliff and I'm just going to jump and we are going to make it. Uh, because young people in Brazil mean that much to us and we are not going to let them down like Rose was saying about closing the income inequality and and we're going to do this so no challenge is insurmountable but having said that it is a lot of work it is very very tough in the beginning and I would say our biggest challenges in the beginning were uh, firstly we had to write all the curriculum uh, so that, that was hard. And as, as I say, we, we will give you whatever curriculum we've got. We have a lot, a lot, a lot that we can share with you and you can gladly have it for free. And, uh, but in the beginning, you need curriculum. Then the other thing you need is you need money because you have to pay teachers, you, you have to pay rental, you know, all this kind of thing. And so finances is always a challenge. And I believe you have to have somebody in this project that does nothing else than work on finances. And that is a lot of what I do. I spend a lot of my time working on finances because I want to build something that, you know, that we know is going to be here in 100 years time. And, and that's difficult to do. If you're building something for only one year, that's not that hard. But if you're building something for 100 years, then, and you don't have state support, 
then, then you have to really, really work hard at that. And you've got to be very creative and innovative and entrepreneurial. And um, so, so finances, I, 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 I would say, were very difficult in the beginning. And the other thing that was difficult is we were using a method that was unknown. You know, nowadays, things like yoga and meditation, it's more appreciated and accepted in society. When we started 20 years ago, people thought, we some kind of crazy weirdos that came out of the 60s, um, you know, never grew up or something, I don't know, you know, and nobody could understand that this thing could be scientific or validated and, and so on, you know, so then people just think, okay, this is just an Indian thing. It's just uh, some weird, you know, thing, people are going to be walking around in sandals and, uh, you know, long dresses and just, you, you know, I don't know, eating strange food and all, the, all this kind of thing. So in the beginning, corporates didn't take us seriously. And um, that changed when people started to see the tremendous results we had and that this method is absolutely scientific. It absolutely is validated and, and so on. So I think whenever you do something new or very innovative, I mean, think when Steve Jobs came with the iPhone, everybody thought, how could the iPhone do all those things that he promised, you know? It sounds impossible, but now all of us, we carry iPhones, we use it every single day and it's just part of life. It makes life better and it's just how it is. So when somebody tells you, you can do a little technique for 20 minutes, your IQ can go up, your memory improves, your creativity improves you say that's nonsense it's rubbish because if it was possible everybody would be doing it you know and it's just like anything new in society it takes time for this thing to percolate but then over time everybody goes i can use an iphone every day and then people realize i've got much more potential inside me that i can use and it's just doesn't make sense not to use that potential now for us we're at a different stage because now we have built some wonderful assets um uh, you, you, you know, we've got you know, tens of millions of dollars already in an endowment and um, we're still building that and we have already some buildings and properties and things like that, which is very beautiful. Um, but now for us, it's how do we really scale large? How do we become ultra low cost, create the best possible quality education imaginable for people across Africa? We are facing unimaginable suffering in our content, uh, continent and particularly amongst youth. And this COVID crisis in our country alone, 3 million people have lost their jobs in three months. And so the unemployment, the starvation, the hunger, the desperation, the woman abuse, it's unimaginable. And, and so for us, it's really, how do we scale this model? How do we scale this across Africa? Um, leveraging technology, leveraging partners and creating franchisees, you know, like um, uh, that have this kind of social passion and mission for young people in poverty. Finding more jobs in very, very difficult economies and, um, and, and, and still raising finances to create perpetual sustainability, et cetera. So I, I would say that there's still challenges, but they change over time. And, you know, so now it's not survival month by month like it was in the beginning, um, but, but, but now it's, uh, you know, growing this impact. And one, one of the things that's come out of our work is that we were asked by the deputy president of the country, because we've had such incredible success with such destitute youth, like we have taken children from street shelters who are now millionaires, you know? So people hear about this kind of thing and they hear these people talk on television and, and, and so on. So the former deputy president approached me to, to create a national task team around youth unemployment. So now, for example, we're putting entrepreneurship and creativity, et cetera, into the whole South African school system. Um, I am the national chair of this. This program already will reach millions of young people this year. And, and this is how we're seeing this thing grow. But again, there's different challenges because now you have to deal with unions in the school system. You have to deal with all kinds of different things, um, you, you, you know, things like that. So it's not that the challenges I think go away, they change. Um, the most important thing is to never give up, to have the passion, to have that belief in young people. Um, this love, you know, love for humanity, uh, that things can be different. Yeah. Rosie. Can you, uh, você pode fazer para a gente os, as suas considerações finais aí, talvez contando um pouco como é que você vê, quem é que vai se interessar por este, por este programa no Brasil, 
É, o que, que você quer contar um pouco para a gente do que, que você vê aqui nessa nossa, nesse nosso início de caminhada com esse método no Brasil? Bom, Denise, eu vejo os vários desafios, né? o Ted falou, não é fácil e não é mesmo, né? as pessoas falam Ai, que maravilhoso, educação é a base de tudo, educação que transforma, é, precisamos de um currículo inovador, Isso é, as pessoas pensam já fora da caixa, o que é muito desafio para nós é agir fora da caixa. Isso no Brasil ainda está muito difícil. É, a gente vai precisar aprender a agir fora da caixa. Faz muito tempo uh, já temos um discurso de que a educação que vai resolver tudo, mas a gente ainda não caminhou. A gente caminhou muito, mas a gente tem muito que caminhar. Então, esse é o nosso desafio. E agir fora da caixa é ver realmente que o nosso currículo ele tem que sim estar tá baseado em alguns processos cognitivos, em conteúdo, mas o mais importante é ver a subjetividade de cada sujeito, né? é ver as habilidades socioemocionais. Quando a gente vê a Flávia falando, tem muita gente que não acredita ainda no processo de meditação, eu faço curso com ela, eu medito, eu acredito nisso. A gente precisa primeiro acreditar nesta mudança, não no sentido de que é um amor que é legal, que é verdadeiramente importante a gente agora partir para uma ação diferente. E essa ação diferente é olhar um currículo diferente, verdadeiro, gostar das pessoas, a gente precisa saber amar as pessoas. Né? Quando a gente fala do dinheiro, eu concordo, o dinheiro é um desafio enorme, mas ele não é a solução para uma transformação, porque se fosse, né, as pessoas colocam dinheiro em várias iniciativas e não há transformação. Existem iniciativas muito picadas é nesse país, né? E, e as coisas não transformam. Ou a gente coloca um projeto de país baseado nisso tudo que o TED está nos ensinando, ou a gente não caminha. Tá? Mas são esses desafios que vai criando possibilidades para a gente. Então, quando o TED fala um monte de coisa, isso já são possibilidades para a gente agir fora da caixa. Como que a gente pode começar agora, né, Denise? A FEDUC está nesse processo, e não é fácil mesmo, Ted, você realmente está num processo muito à frente da gente, eu tenho muito que aprender com você. Essa metodologia, a gente tem que fazer um curso, né, quase que um mestrado nessa metodologia, mas a gente já aprendeu bastante, né? O que é olhar esse sujeito com amor e olhar esse diferente com respeito. Trazer a diferença para cima do topo, e a gente, com maior. A pr primeira intenção que a gente tem é ajudar pessoas. Resolvido isso, as possibilidades vêm. Como é que a gente consegue esses alunos? Né? Nossos alunos, a gente tem 48 milhões de alunos matriculados na escola pública, 81% só da educação básica. Então, é muita gente querendo fazer coisas. E, e, e não é da geração que a gente fala nem trabalha, nem estuda. A gente fala né, na FEDUC, nem nos deram trabalho, nem nos deram estudo. Então. E a gente tem uma, um potencial muito grande de dar trabalho e dar estudo a essa juventude. Como? Que a gente tem empresas que pensam que nós, igual a nós. Né? Que a gente tem empresa realmente que tem como a responsabilidade social, não só em bandeira, mas em ação. Uma empre... As empresas tiverem é, é, par... como parceira nossa nesse projeto, tem muito a ganhar. Primeiro vai ser uma empresa que... de responsabilidade social e vai ser uma empresa que vai estar mudando a trajetória desse país, a trajetória dessa juventude. E, em segundo lugar, vão ter pessoas com soft skill nas né, empresas, né? com tudo aquilo que a gente acha yeah, que é, right. é, é, essas pessoas têm que ter na empresa. Não só uma capacidade técnica, que as pessoas são muito recrutadas dentro yeah. da empresa pela capacidade técnica, mas, na maioria das vezes, elas vão embora por uma capacidade de habilidade socioemocional. Então, vão ser empresas que vão estar recebendo esses jovens com tanto com conteúdo quanto uma capacidade socioemocional muito interessante. Então, eu acho que as empresas vão se interessar bastante. Vai ser desafio para todo mundo, mas possibilidade para a gente impactar mais jovens nesse país. E não só empresas vão poder participar nesse início, mas as famílias também, né? Assim como a família Lenz Ibeira, que enxerga que tem capacidade de poder fazer essa diferença, eu acho que vão ser grandes parceiros. Depois as empresas acabam recebendo os jovens é, que vão trabalhar lá, ou o próprio mercado como empreendedores. Uma parte importante das pessoas que saem do Instituto na África do Sul vão empreender, porque querem empreender, porque desenvolvem esse gosto empreendedor. E o resto as empresas vão receber. Eu acho que tudo vai dentro de um ecossistema que fica interessante. Né? 
É, Flávia, queria falar os seus closing remarks para a gente aqui? Que mensagem você deixa? Eu queria agradecer muito ao TED, a esse trabalho incrível que ele tem feito, que nos inspira. Né? Contamos muito com o apoio dele para fazer é, algo parecido aqui no Brasil. É, agradecer muito a Rose também, muito feliz aí que está firme aí na meditação. <risos> Depois a gente conversa um pouco mais sobre. É, e estou muito empolgada com, com, esse novo, com esse novo desafio aí. É, eu acho que agora vai, estou sentindo que <risos> agora sai do papel, sai do, do sonho e vamos materializar isso. É, é, temos muitos desafios, temos muitas coisas para realizar, mas já sabemos o caminho das pedras, já, já sabemos como começar. Né? Então, já temos muitas pessoas interessadas em apoiar, é, em, e a necessidade é, urge, né? cada vez mais a gente precisa fazer algo, a gente tem ferramentas para isso, sabemos como mudar, só precisamos agora implementar. Então, eu queria agradecer muito você, Denise, por Sim. todo o seu empenho, uh, pelo convite, estou muito realmente feliz e esperançosa que agora, agora vai. E agradecer é, a todos é... que ficaram aqui com a gente também. É, né? é isso aí. Queria agradecer muito a todos vocês, o empenho são de vocês, é, eu sou uma juntadora de, de peças só, é, acho que a gente fazer esse, esse primeiro, essa primeira rodada na FEDUC vai ser fundamental e eu acho que a gente vai chegar no ponto como está fazendo hoje o TED, é, muitos anos depois, que a escola pública venha e pegue essa metodologia para colocar dentro da escola pública. Mas a gente tem que formar os pilotos, mostrar o, o valor, mostrar os resultados e, ao mesmo tempo, já botar uma quantidade importante também de famílias e de jovens dentro da sociedade é, de uma maneira produtiva, brilhante, menos sofrimento, menos estresse. Então, eu queria agradecer a todos vocês que estiveram aqui essa manhã com a gente. Great. Ted, thank you so much for your time. Nós vamos realmente chamar vocês outras vezes para ir contando aqui os, os avanços. Obrigada, André Acrobat, que está aqui com a gente hoje, que vai ser a nossa é, Project Manager a partir da semana que vem. É, e, e vamos em frente. Tânia, que é a nossa produtora de todo esse evento, muito obrigada. obrigada Helena e Lara, Tânia. nossas tradutoras, muito obrigada. É, e a todos vocês que estiveram com a gente nessa manhã. Toda sexta-feira, às quatro da tarde, temos um talk para falar de coisas que eu espero que seja do interesse de todos vocês. Teddy, thank you so much. Bless you. Lots of help. Thank you. Denise, thank you to you. Thank you. Really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. Obrigada. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye. Good day. Take care.